Hi, welcome to lecture one of um, developmental psychology and we're going to be looking at explaining how attachments form. You need to know the definition of attachment so if you get anything from this definition you need to get that it is an emotional bond and it has to be a two-way process so for example you cannot get attached to your teddy bear because a teddy bear cannot reciprocate yeah so very important you take those two at least those two bits um, off what the definition is so our first theory is the learning theory and they termed um, attachment so how um, babies and caregivers get attached they termed it covered love theory and that is simply is because it's all based around food it's all based about people get attached to their primary caregivers because of the supply of food that they give to them um, learning theory for attachment they focus on the two main ways in terms of, of how we learn behavior because they see attachment as a type of learned behavior so the first one you need to know is classical conditioning and a key word associated with classical conditioning is learning via association so do not write classical conditioning without writing the word association so classical conditioning so how babies um, I'm sure your teachers would have told you about Pavlov and his dogs etc just leave those just leave that out because examiners actually don't like you talking about Pavlov and his dogs because that's actually got nothing to do with attachment they just use the um, the principles of that to explain how babies become attached and caregivers become attached so just a little um, brief of classical conditioning so before conditioning conditioning just just generally means learning yeah so before learning we have a UCS and in this case, the UCS is a milk bottle, or it could be the mother's breast. It doesn't matter. The UCS can be anything. It just make, basically means unconditioned stimulus. And the unconditioned stimulus naturally gives a reaction. So when the baby sees or drinks or, or spots the milk, they automatically feel happy. And the feeling of happiness is an unconditional response. It means that we can't control it. Yeah? Um... It happens automatically so unconditional response could also be un um, sadness could be anxiousness could be fear there's things that we can't control of um, can't we can't control that happens quite naturally so this UCS generally has a um, an effect on how we feel so milk um, in terms of this particular diagram so milk um, makes the baby feel happy here unconditional response so during learning the milk plus the neutral stimulus, and in this case, the neutral stimulus is the mother. So this is what happens, obviously, because um, learning theory says all our behaviours, we've learnt every single thing. So if um, the baby keeps seeing these two parents where the milk, every time they have this beautiful, lovely white liquid and their mother is around, the baby starts feeling happy. They're like, OK, so I'm starting to see an association between these these two things here. So. When you know the baby has been conditioned or have, has learnt, what happens is the baby automatically just starts feeling happy, which is now the conditioned response, every time they see the mother. Yeah, So the mother is no longer the neutral stimulus. The mother's now been conditioned. That is the learnt stimulus. So you don't really need the milk anymore because the baby's thinking, oh, milk is coming because I see this person coming. So that is how the attachment forms. So you actually don't need the milk for the baby to start feeling happy. So that is the um, principles of classical conditioning. Okay. The next way we learn is through operant conditioning. And a key word of operant conditioning is learning via reinforcement. So this can be either positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement. And what we mean by reinforcement is it means something is kind of like stamped in. It's like a behavior that is stamped in. So if, for example, a teacher gives detention, um, or let's give a better example, if a teacher gives... Um, 50 pounds to students who do their homework students who got the 50 pounds are more likely to continue doing their homework because of the chance that they could get 50 pounds again so that behavior is stamped in so that's what we mean by positively reinforcing something so operant conditioning brief diagram um hungry baby yeah so when we're hungry we feel uncomfortable and we have that inner drive to try and resolve that horrible uncomfortable feeling that we have okay and that baby knows that the milk is some kind of positive reinforcer yeah so the baby is now happy because it's had the milk so what happens in operant conditioning is 
the milk canal acts as the primary reinforcer that is stamped in. The child knows that that thing, that um, white liquid, makes that uncomfortable feeling, that hun uncomfortable hunger go away. And what happens is it's because the primary caregiver is the one that's given this lovely liquid, the primary caregiver is known as the secondary reinforcer. Yeah. So what happens is the baby now associates that white milk with the mother or the primary caregiver. So, for example, where's that person that gives me that white stuff when I feel that pain in my belly? So the baby will actively seek that person that gives them their main primary reinforcement, which is the milk. So that is the learning theory as a whole. You should know the key words there is all our behavior is learnt. And we learn this through either classical or operant conditioning. So you need to know about the UCS, UCR, etc. And um, operant conditioning, positive reinforcement. And make sure you use plenty of examples and explanations. Um, our evaluation for learning theory. So we can say, so here I've decided to do one strength in green and two weaknesses. So we can say um, Donald and Miller found in a first year babies are fed 2,000 times by their primary caregiver. Not really a strong um, case for evidence, but we haven't really got anything much else to go on here. Um, we've got Harlow's monkeys, which is a limitation. Um, just looking at Harlow's monkeys, this is a key study, again, you have to learn. Um, what Harlow done is they wanted to test this theory of attachment, so they isolated baby rhesus monkeys from their habitat and basically they um, brought them up in an isolated environment where they had one wire monkey and that wire monkey so it's a fake wire monkey and it had like a bottle sticking out of it and it also had another fake monkey or surrogate mother which had a warm blanket a very very warm terry cloth blanket attached to it and what they found is that the monkey spent did spend most of their time with the cloth covered monkey um sorry cloth covered a mother which kind of goes against what the learning theory was saying because the learning theory was saying it's all about food but harlow's theory found out it's actually not really all about food it's more probably more to do with comfort okay so that is some evidence however just looking at the key evaluation stuff um monkeys how can we generalize those to human beings or the whole unethic the whole ethics of it because um, these monkeys were isolated from the natural habitat and even after the experiment they couldn't really assimilate they couldn't really um, go back into the environment because they're really like socially awkward so they couldn't really interact with the other monkeys so that is really an ethics issue there okay, so that's a key undermining study there um, and finally the other limitation is that we do have lack of research support yeah there's no really other studies which show that it's all about food and we've learned all our behavior, especially attachment. Okay, so that's all we need to know about learning theory. The next theory is Bowlby's theory, and Bowlby's theory is basically an evolutionary theory. In a nutshell, evolutionary theory is all about survival of the fittest. Us um, human babies, yeah, human animals, unfortunately, um, we can't do things much for ourselves when we're born. So when we're born, we expect somebody to feed us, clothe us, keep us warm, to protect us. And it's all about survival. So in this case, we have been born we, we have been born with particular features. This is what we call innate. We've been born with particular features, like and we just noticed that all babies, all baby mammals and stuff, they have these little cute little squashy noses, they have these like big eyes. They've got these like little dimple cheeks. It's, it's, they just they all have more or less the same type of features. And this is basically so um, our caregivers would want to look after us. Unfortunately, if you're an ugly baby, no one's it's very difficult to look after. I think that's what the evolutionary theory was trying to point out. So we're born, babies are so cute and lovable with these features, so people can want to look after them and they want to protect them. Yeah, so they don't throw them away in a dustbin or something because that would not en ensure our survival. OK, so social releases. So we're born with these um, attributes of these particular features. And we're also um, um, and we're also born with being able to. Have you noticed when babies are born, they start crying or babies are cooing or babies are smiling. All these kind of things are innate. And that's what we call social releases because they're social because they happen in an environment and they want our caregiver to want to come and look after us. If we don't cry, for example, how is our caregiver going to know we're hungry? If we don't coo or we don't smile, 
how is our caregiver going to know that we're happier that we're content yeah so we have to do these things social releases we have to do them so the caregiver can know how to look after us and what happens is once we start doing these social releases for example um monotropy so a, a, a monotropy um figure is just that primary um caregiver is the person who babies are most discriminate to so some babies for example they're so clingy to their mother it's usually their mother or sometimes their father but they want to follow them everywhere that's that's how we know that person is their monotropy figure and what happens the secure base this is just basically because us human babies we love to explore so much yeah and again we're a danger to ourselves what happens if they do explore and they do happen to um, come across some issues and they hurt themselves we know that we can go back to our monotropy figure who's that one person okay and this has to so this kind of bond with the monotropy figure has to happen within the first two years or otherwise Bowlby, was, Bowlby said it's basically too late it's not going to happen and what happens internal working model just basically means how our first relationships are with our caregiver that's how we expect other relationships to be so if our caregiver was really sensitive to us and um, beck and called for our every need um, we expect other people to be like that for us and this then goes on to the continuity hypothesis. So your first relationship is going to be how your future romantic relationships would be, will be. So for example, you can have a very insecure relationship. I quite like this one. I had a dream that you cheated on me. Apologize. You can have a lot of those insecure people in relationships simply because based on the continuity hypothesis, their first relationships were not the best. Or you can have very secure relationships where you're very secure within you. You know that person, for example, is going to be there for you. Is going to um, you could, it's like going to be like a safe base because of your primary um, primary caregiver. That type of first relationship. Okay. So evaluation. We have. Um, okay, oh, by the way, when you're writing Bowlby's theory, you need to remember all this stuff. That's that's remember every single part just like I spoke to you about it remember it so there's one way to remember it. if you remember I'm so secure children in crisis so you're basically saying I'm secure but there are children in crisis basically so that will go for um, innate monotropy um, um, secure base then we have social releases then we have continuity hypothesis internal working model um, and then we have um, critical or sensitive period within the first two years. So try and remember the acronym because you need to be able to ex fully explain this in an evolutionary theory. Um, then we have Shaffer and Emerson, research and support because it's in green. And um, again, I'm not going to read it for too much, but they basically found that it's not just um, it, um, that kids, for example, they did have loads and loads and loads of um, people who... Um, fed them, who played with them, but they still actually had one primary attachment figure, which kind of supports Bowlby's theory, the whole monotropy thing, that we do have one primary caregiver. We can also use this study as well to go against the learning theory, because even though um, there, there are loads of people there, but that, the infants were not just attached to that person who fed them, where well, the learning theory said it has to be the person who feeds you. OK, so I've got some key questions here as well for um, if, for evaluation in terms of where it was done. So in terms of um, being able to generalize to different society observations, it could be quite biased. 60 is quite a small number. And then they're just done working class kids. What about the middle class infants? So you have to be able to know how to evaluate everything you come across. And we can, um, as, a, as, an, as another strength, I decided to do two strengths here. We have real world applications. So because of Bulb, we have learned so much about childcare and daycare practices. It's unbelievable. So we know how important it is to be with your child within the first few years of life because of this whole critical sensitive period. OK, however, as a limitation, we can ex this basically and um, the whole attachment can be explained using a temperament hypothesis not just um, the evolutionary hypothesis. The temperament just basically means personality. We all have different personality um, when, we're, when we're babies. And Belskin Rovin found that when they looked at one to three and um, three day old babies, um, they found